כן. כן. So, the question is, some rabbis accept the pe'ah, accept the wig as something that's allowed in Judaism, and some rabbis say it's not allowed. Now, you said before the shiur that you've never seen any of my shiurim. So the reason why I specifically mention that is because anyone that has seen my shurim knows that I'm actually very soft-spoken about the subject. <laughs> so here's the answer. Now, in the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, the original debate about Pe'anochrit, about wigs, begins. And the Chamim say, what if a woman has a uh, bald spot? She has a bald spot. Can she put something there? So yes, she can put some hair there from a tail of a horse or uh, some type of uh, replacement of hair, but she must cover it with a hat, and the two have to be tied to each other, meaning you have to sew the hair to the hat. Why? Because if she just wore the hat and it wasn't sewed together, chas v'shalom, she would take off the hat and show people our hair. And that's a yisuf from Torah, it's not allowed. But if they're sewed together, she would never take off the hat because then she would put, show people her nakedness, her, uh, her, uh, her bald spot. No woman in their right mind would ever do such a thing. That's where the original debate starts a couple of thousand years ago. But originally, the whole argument was, is a woman allowed to wear hair or not? And the answer was yes, as long as it's covered with a hat, with a mitpachat, with something. Meaning you're never supposed to just walk around with just the hair itself. And even though the hair in those days, a couple of thousand years ago, was like a lifa, was something that you would see from a mile away, it's not real hair, still you were never allowed to show such hair. Now about 400 years ago, one Ashkenazi Chacham came out and confused the world, Kvodo Bim Komo, and said, no, you're allowed, in his opinion, you're allowed to just walk around without the hat, just the wig itself. Again, Keep in mind that 400 years ago, the wigs of that day looked nothing like the wigs of today. The wigs of today look better than real hair, and the reason why is because it is real hair. <laughs> Just without the dandruff, the lice, the problems, the gray hairs, and all of that. But anyway, 400 years ago, it came out, confused the world, said yes. But most of the Chachamim throughout the generations went against them. But it became a, uh, over the last hundred or so years, it became pretty much common that Ashkenazim, many of them didn't voice their opinion or even said it's allowed to wear a wig. Sfaradim, on the other hand, said it's forbidden 100%, with the exceptions of a few cases. Now, most people think that it's most of the Ashkenazim in history that said it's allowed. And that's the mistake. We have, I have a list with me, and the reason why I say this is Siyat Dishma is because who comes with a list? I have a list with me of 127 of the biggest poskim in history of Am Yisrael that spoke and wrote about the subject. Poskim meaning the, 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 the biggest rabbis in history Oh, the exception of a few poskim that in a, in a Sephardic world. A few poskim in a Sephardic world said it's allowed also. But most of them say it's not allowed. Most of the poskim in a Sephardic world say it's not allowed. Not allowed to wear a wig. But the reality is that most of the Ashkenazi poskim also say it's not allowed to wear a wig. Now, this is not the conclusion. I'm giving you all the background so you know where we're at today. I'm painting you a picture and then I'm going to destroy the entire picture. 
So now the picture is that most people think that all of the Ashkenazi Puskim said it's allowed, all the Sephardi Puskim say it's not allowed. This is not true. In fact, most of the Puskim, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, say it's not allowed. Only a few exceptions say it is allowed. Namely, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was the biggest advocate of Whigs. But the one thing that no one ever said it's allowed is the immodesty that came with it after. Meaning the, the actual wigs that they said were allowed were very different than the wigs of today. But today's wigs make every woman, whether she's 20 or 90, look like she's 20. <laughs> and just came off the runway. Sometimes they act as if they're still on the runway with the <laughs> And they make sure that you know that it's, the hair is flowing with the wind Now To win this argument is impossible Why? Ashkenazi is going to tell you listen. I like you. You're a nice guy. Your story is entertaining, but I have my rabbi I have my rabbi. He's Ashkenazi. He says it's allowed you do your thing I do my thing. The Sephardi is going to tell me, listen, I'm Sephardi, but there's a couple of Ashkenazi Chachamim that I like also. And there's even a couple of uh, Sephardi Chachamim that says I like them also. I'm going to hold by them. So that's why the Machloket, the debate between the two sides is a complete waste of time. I still had to tell you this Machloket because you're going to hear it somewhere else. Now, I say that wigs are forbidden for a different reason. It has nothing to do with Sephardi or Ashkenazi. It has nothing to do with it. Now, I have a list with me. I'm going to show anyone that's interested. 127 poskim, all the way from the time of Yonatan ben Uziel, 2,500 years ago, to the Vilna Gaon, to Rav Ovadia, biggest poskim in history, not like no-name rabbis. All the biggest people you've ever heard in history, they said it's not allowed. But let's ignore as if they didn't say it. Let's just pretend they didn't say it. And the local Chabad rabbi is more important than the Vilna Gaon. And the local uh, rabbi that you like from the Sephardi community is more important than Yonatan ben Uziel that was able to create fire just from studying Torah. Let's pretend they're better. Let's pretend. We have to find unity. Unity, right? Unity is important for Am Yisrael. We have to find a unified opinion. Something everyone agrees before I left the business world, I found the unified opinion before I even knew what the unified opinion was. Part of my job in the business world was doing research. I would do research on businesses. You gave me a business, you gave me any business, I could tell you exactly how much it's worth and whether it's going to succeed or fail. I could tell you which you sell it, you should buy it, so on and so forth. This was part of what I did. Because in order to invest, you have to know what you're talking about. Funny thing is, I can build other people's businesses better than mine. But nonetheless, I would do research on different industries, different economies, and so on and so forth. I could identify red flags. I was able to uncover several companies that were cooking the books, a couple of Ponzi schemes. Unfortunately, no one wants to listen anyway, so people still invest and lose money. I told a person that if you invest in this company, that told him that they're going to be the next Disneyland, he'll lose every single penny because they're both thieves. He didn't listen and he lost every penny. I told investors this one company was cooking the books, they didn't want to listen, so they lost the money. Meaning that people would want advice until they don't like it, it doesn't agree with the pre-existing opinion. But anyway, at one point, I did some research and I looked into the hair industry for some random reason. At the time, I thought it's a random reason. And I found out that the hair industry has grown drastically and the reason why is because there is a place in the world where you can get the best hair in the world meaning the best quality hair in the world there's hair everywhere if you go to half Africa Israel America there's hair everywhere that's one thing that doesn't stop growing even after you die there's hair everywhere hair and nails doesn't stop growing and your ears but anyway the <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the thing is though, is that this is something you can find anywhere. 
but everything in the world costs money. If I want to buy a jacket, it costs money. If I buy a jacket from Paris, it'll cost me a certain price. I buy it from New York, a different price. I buy it from Armani, it costs a different price. Buy it from uh, clothes out, different price. Meaning the quality makes a difference. Now, what if I told you you could buy the best? The best of the best. There's nothing better. And not only that, it's free. It's the best, and it's free. You tell me it's already too good to be true. I say, okay, you know what? I'm going to add even more. I'm going to give you the best, and not only is it free, not only is it free, but it's so abundant, I have so much of it, it doesn't matter how much you order, I'll always be able to meet the demand. This, any normal businessman says, where do I sign? Where do I sign? I'm going to sell my house, I'm going to sell my kids, I'm going to sell my wife, I'm going to invest everything into this business. Why? It's the greatest business in the world. Now, if you go to Cambodia and you want to buy some hair, you can get some hair, but if you have a big store, you're not going to be able to buy as much as you want. Why? Because it's limited supply. If you go to Brazil, you can buy some hair, but even though they tell you it's from Brazil, it really it's not. Still, let's say you believe it's from Brazil. You can't buy as much as you want. And let's say you go to Paris or you go to Italy and you find a bunch of homeless people that want to sell their hair. And you convince a bunch of them to sell their hair. Still, you're limited. You cannot supply the market. There's only one place in the world that can supply the market. And that place is India. Now, here's the problem with getting the hair from India. In India, it's part of their religion to donate their hair to idols. Meaning that their hair becomes a korban, becomes a sacrifice to an idol. And that means that you can have all of India donate the hair, but you're still not allowed to use it. And the reason why is because the Torah tells us, and all opinions agree, there's no Ashkenazi Sephardi here. It doesn't make a difference. Torah tells us, as soon as something became a part of idolatry, you're no longer allowed to enjoy it. You're no longer, you're not allowed to eat it, you're not allowed to sell it, you're not allowed to enjoy it in any way, shape, or form. Where do we learn it from? In several places in the Torah, Gemara Masechet Abu Dazra talks about it extensively, but there's one Maaseh that most of you have heard, by Yeshua ben Nun. Yeshua ben Nun, that took over after Moshe Rabbeinu, went into the land of Israel. The first thing that Hashem told him, after circumcising all of Am Yisrael and fighting the wars, what did He tell them? He told them, destroy all the trees. What did the trees do? What the trees uh, did something? He said, no, somebody worshipped these trees. Okay, somebody worshipped them, but they're not here anymore. Once somebody worshipped the tree, that tree has no right to exist. The only mitzvah you can fulfill with something that was used for idolatry is destroy it. You're not allowed to do anything with it. You're not allowed to sell it, even if it's a diamond that's worth infinity amount of money that you can buy and build a million kolos, a million yeshivot. You're still not allowed to do it. The only thing you're allowed to do is destroy it. Why? Because avodah zarah, idolatry, is the epitome of the opposite of Hashem. It's you've replaced everything, which is Hashem, with nothing. So to enjoy the nothing instead of Hashem is it's the biggest insult in the world, spitting in Hashem's face. So now in India, they have not only people donating their hair, but they have over a billion people in India, meaning it's one of the biggest populations in the world, of which the average Indian, after we did research, donates their hair three times in their life. Meaning that every year no less than just children alone just children we're not counting adults yet just children alone which from them comes the best hair no less than 25 million children get their hair shaved off their head as part of their birthday celebration at three years old Le'avdi, like am israel what we do as a minag but they shave their head for avodah zarah the adults shave their head for different reasons for Avodah Zarah. Now once you have one, two, three people donating their hair, you can't build a market from that. 
But when you have between 25 to 60 million people donating their hair every single year, that creates a market. In fact, that is the market. And that's why anyone that does honest research about real hair wigs will know for sure that over 90% of the hair, the real hair wigs in the world, come from idol worship, come from Avodah Zarah. Which means that it doesn't make a difference if you're Ashkenazi, or Sfaradi, or Chabad, or Litai, or you could be an alien. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> if you want to serve Hashem, you're not allowed to enjoy Avodah Zarah, even if you're a Goy. Even the non-Jew is not allowed to do it. So here, Rabotai Karim is the closing argument. You want to serve Hashem? You cannot wear a real hair wig. Now what about the synthetic? We also did some research on that. After testing some synthetic wigs, the average synthetic wig has approximately 3% real hair in it. Why? Because there's so much, there's such an abundance of real hair from India that it's actually cheaper than synthetic. Even though you buy the wig in the, the wig store, it's $2,000. And then they sell the same hair for $30. Why? Because over here you won't pay $2,000, so we'll sell it to you for $2,000. So you want to be a sucker over here. Over here now we want to be a sucker, so we'll pay $30 for it. Meaning it all depends on whatever you want to buy. Whatever you want to pay, we'll charge you for that. That's, that's the reality. Why? Because there's just so much of it. So synthetic wigs, you cannot, unfortunately, rely on that either because you don't need the whole wig to be from Abu Dazara. It needs to be one hair. A single hair on the wig is from idolatry. Already, the whole wig is asu. Now, what about if the store and the panit, the wig maker, tells you, no, no, no. Look, the sticker says... It's from Brazil. The sticker says from Cambodia. The sticker says it's from uh, China. The sticker says it's from Gainom, wherever you want it to be. It's not, it's not from India. Well, anyone that knows a little bit of business knows that any time in, 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 merchant, in merchant banking, you learn about what businesses do. In investments, you learn about what businesses do. And you know that every time you take goods, from one country, and you move them to another country. Let's say, for example, I wanted the jacket, but the people that make the buttons are real experts, but they're not in the same country. They're not in Italy. They're in China. So I'm going to send the jacket to China. Now, as soon as I send the jacket to China, they put the buttons. Now they change the sticker from made in Italy to made in China. Even though originally the jacket was made in Italy. It doesn't make a difference. Now it made, change the sticker, made in China. But now I said, no, no, but I, wanna, I want it to be made in Italy. So what do I do? I send them back to Italy, put another string on it, put another string on it, and now it's made in Italy again. Now it's made in Italy again. Every time you change a place, a shore, and there's some type of work done, the sticker changes. So when you see the wig that says made in Brazil, made in Cambodia, made in Guam, made in wherever you want it to make, it means nothing. All it means is they added one hair from somewhere over there and they're calling it by that country. And the reason, the proof of that is that even if you go and ask the people in Brazil, do you have people that donate their hair? They're going to start laughing in your face. Why? Because the Brazilians would rather commit suicide <laughs> than shave their head. Now they say, no, no, but my wig came from England or it came from, uh, from uh, France. Do you see any French people walking around with bald heads? <laughs> Meaning that if, if there was enough people to supply the market, you would see millions and millions of French people walking around with bald heads. There is no such thing. But there is such a thing in India. There are millions and millions of bald people in India. You do find it over there nowhere else. Last question in regards to the wigs that people are going to say is, what about the kosher certification? There's rabbis. There are rabbis that put a kosher stamp. There's a kosher stamp in Israel. There's a kosher stamp in America. There's a kosher stamp in a lot of things. Well, Rabotai Karim, like I said, to have a beard doesn't mean that much. It's free. Even a taish, even a goat has one. 
doesn't mean that you're going to say the truth. Kosher certification doesn't actually mean anything is kosher. It just means that there's business being done. That's all it means. When something is impossible to kosherize, it doesn't make a difference to the kosher stamp. It's impossible to kosherize a wig. Impossible. And the reason why is because in order for a wig to be kosher, that means that you have to monitor the hair that's being shaved from three women because every hair, every pe'ah, every wig is three heads, not one-to-one. It's not one-to-one equivalent. It's three heads. Why? Because the wig, if you notice it, why is it so beautiful? Because all of the hair is the same length. So obviously no woman has all of her hair the same length. It's, it's, some is long, some is short, some is gray, some is bad, some is good. So they take three heads, they take the best of the best of the three heads, and they make it into one wig. So now, you're not going to have one wig from one head. You're going to have three heads. But that means that the factory has to monitor the hair from the time they shave it from three separate women all the way through they go on the next head of the next person which is an impossible process why because if you actually go online and look at the actual manufacturing that's done the, the all the things that go through that the hair goes through it's impossible to ever track even a single hair from the time it's taken off of somebody's head all the way until it arrives at somebody else even a single hair not a whole week just one hair you can't track if you can't track it you can't use it if let's say for example i told you listen you know the meat that you're, you're buying? I believe it's kosher. And you're going to tell me, okay, what's your proof? Well, I saw the cow. I looked at it and I said, do you think uh, you're going to be a kosher cow? And the cow said, yeah, I'm going to be a kosher cow. It's like, oh, so you're going to let the guy, uh, you know, slaughter you without giving any problems? No problems. And I saw that uh, they saw each other. And the cow looked at the shochet and it winked its eye. And I left. I said, oh, I'm relying on this cow. This cow is reliable. And I leave. And eventually the steak arrives at your house. You say, oh, this came from the same cow. I say, yes. How do you know? I don't know. Meaning, it's a, it's, a, it's a demented argument. Without following the whole process, how they slaughter the cow, to make sure it's the same exact cow, to make sure that the cow, after it's slaughtered, it was checked, what's inside, whether it's sick, whether it's not sick, whether the lungs were punctured. You can't just decide, oh, just because this cow is this way, that means the rest of it is going to work out okay. You can't just decide that just because one step is good, the rest of it is good. To make tefillin takes over a thousand alachot, a thousand different steps to make tefillin. Kosher food that you eat has an enormous amount of eyes monitoring the cow or the sheep or whatever animal is being slaughtered from the time it's being literally born until it arrives on your plate on Shabbat. Enormous amount of eyes. Every single step. If at one point somebody missed something, what do they do? They sell it to halal, to the Arabs. That's why every shochet next door has halal. Every time you see a shochet, every time you see a butcher, next door there's always, or down the street, there's always halal. Why? Everything that's not kosher, they sent to him. That's why, because they also slaughter their, their, their animals, but they don't have the same rules like we do, so they buy our non-kosher. Because for them it's halal, for them it's still okay. For them, it doesn't make a difference if the animal suffered or anything like that. So, but for us, as Am Yisrael, if we miss one step, we're not allowed to eat it. Even though it's one bite, even though it's one sandwich, Hashem says, if you eat it, you become tameh. You become impure by eating one sandwich that's not kosher. So if you become not kosher by eating not kosher one time, what do you think about what you become if you put avodah zara on your head all the time not just one time all the time so this abotai it doesn't make a difference what your rabbi or his rabbi or that rabbi said if someone can prove without any doubt that their wig came from a kosher place for sure without a doubt and you want to rely on the leniency that's your risk but at least you have something to rely on but until you have that, there's nothing to rely on other than gambling your whole eternity on this. So now you're going to tell me last but not least, yeah, but there's probably more religious women wearing these wigs, big rabbit sins that are very holy. What, you're telling me that they're all uh, part of this idolatry? Yes. 
Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Yes, that's exactly. And they're not doing it on purpose. But yes, yes, that's part of it. Now, where is there, where is there a source in the Torah that, Ra, that Rabbanit is making a mistake? And then I'll open to more questions. Shalom bait. Okay, so for shalom bait, we uh, make a shem, a shem an enemy. That's a, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new theory. He's not mekubal. I can tell you that. He's mekubal maybe at home, There's, but not in not in klal Israel. Mekubal rabotai means that you're above and beyond the law. You're doing something that's if you're, you're let's say for example you do one tefillin that you do two tefillin. If you keep Shabbat 24 hours, he keeps Shabbat 26 hours. That's mekubal does above and beyond what's necessary. Even more than a chassid. But if you tell me, no, no, I'm going to violate Hashem's law because I don't want my wife to yell at me. Now, I'm not judging anyone, but again, everyone has to understand there's black, there are certain things in Torah that are black and white. There are certain things that are black and white, and there are certain things that are gray. That both this and this are right. Until recent, there was, until recent discovery that we brought to light over the last two years, People had some level of argument to say, you know what, I'm going to rely on the Ashkenazi scheme, on the Lubavitcher Rebbe that said you're allowed to wear a wig as long as it's modest. Like you said, as long as it's modest, it's not like one of those that reaches the floor, it's modest, I can rely on it. Because I'm Ashkenazi. Fine. Now you have nothing to rely on. You have nothing to rely on. Why? Because unless you can confirm that every single strand of hair that you have on top of your head came from a kosher place, not from India, you have nothing to rely on. There's a book that some Talmidei Chachamim that we work with in, in, in Israel came out with recently. We uh, published it online a few months ago. It's 240 pages. Anyone that wants to read it, it's in Hebrew, but anyone that wants to read it, it's available, it's free. There's one that they actually printed a hard copy with pictures. With pictures, huh? Oh, okay, with pictures, serious book. It's for, it's for serious Talmidei Chachamim that want to see the truth. The point is, Rabotai, is that in reality, we never really had an excuse to wear a wig. In reality. But let's say, let's say you wanted to do it and you wanted to use the leniency. Now Hashem is telling us, now you don't even have that. So, because of that, my Rav, Rav Ephraim, he says that this is one of the things that Rav El Yashiv, Allah Shalom, who fought against the Whigs, said that the Mashiach is going to come when Benot Yisrael are going to start doing tshuva for Kisu Rosh. So I figured that since I'm already coming to Canada, maybe I'll help some women do tshuva, so I brought some Kisu Rosh. So whoever wants some Kisu Rosh, you get it for free from Yerushalayim. Anyone that wants to take a mitzvah of Kisu Rosh, we brought you a Kisu Rosh from Yerushalayim. Please, whenever, any of you, oh, but... Also, there's one thing, Rabotai. Only if you're married, yes. But also, also there is one condition. Don't let the rabbis fool you. Rabbi, again, Allah Shalom used to tell us all the time something very important. You don't have to put Rosh unless you're married and unless you have a head. If you're not married or you don't have a head, you don't have to kisu Rosh. But as long as you're married and you have a head, you have to have kisu Rosh. So anyone that wants to have a head and has a husband, Here's the Kisui Rosh for them. This? Oh, this? Or our cameras? Oh. Okay, oh, okay. The other thing I brought for, so you don't think I'm picking on the women, and obviously I didn't know you're going to ask this question. So you see, Siyata Dishmaya. That's Siyata Dishmaya. The other thing, so you don't, see that, you don't think that I'm picking on the, on the women only, I brought Tzitziot for the men. Anyone that wants to put, take a mitzvah, tzitzi. anyone that wants to be a Jew and wants a mitzvah for every second, every second that they're alive, they want to take a mitzvah, have a tzitzi. Do you want a mitzvah? Oh, okay. So last but not least, about he's, he's reminding me of something about the, uh, the wigs, and then I'll answer the questions. There was a scientist that became a rabbi that had a uh, special camera that he developed, which is a camera that can read your aura. Anyone that ever heard of what the aura, the hila, the aura, which is the colors around your body, which show, give a 
impression of your state of being, whether you're holy or not holy, whether you're pure or not pure, mad, and so on and so forth. So he discovered something very, very interesting, is that once a man puts on tefillin, his aura changes color to a very special holy status, either purple or white, white being practically perfect, purple being near perfect. Now, if he took out the cloth, if he took out the scroll from the tefillin, then that person's status drops to worse than normal, meaning if his normal status was yellow, he now became closer to black, meaning he looks terrible, terrible condition. Why? Because he has fake tefillin on. Just a, uh, just a leather without the actual Torah in it. Now he discovered something interesting. He said when a woman puts on a kisurosh, a mitpachat, she has the same aura status as a man that's putting on tefillin. Same status. And he has this on, you can, there's a video online that I, I could send to you. You can see this with your own eyes. It's actually in the book that I brought. It's actually in the house. I'll show you. It's in the book. It shows a woman with a mitpachat. Our aura status is very high. It's the same as a, a Jew that puts on tefillin, kosher tefillin. What about a wig? A woman that puts on a wig, her status is the same thing as fake tefillin. Any wig. Apparently he knew, the aura, the, the, the camera knew before we knew. So, Baruch Hashem, anyone that wants kisurosh, please let me know. I have it for you. I brought plenty of them. Yes. Divorce women. Um Vadi Allah Shalom said that a woman should not go down in Kedusha, should not go down in Kedusha, uh, because once you take on a mitzvah of Kisuro, she shouldn't go down. But if it creates major issues for her to create to, to get a zivug, there are some leniencies that you can rely on that she can go back to having a uh, uh, having a wig or having something that's lower than a uh, thing. But again, the wig itself is not kosher now. So we'd have to replace it with something else. She could uncover her hair. She could uncover her hair, though. Yeah. But I mean, again, this is this is a. Uh, it's not. It's not so pashut. It's not such a simple answer to give, because you're never supposed to lower in kedusha. You're never supposed to lower in kedusha. So if if you do something, you already did something good. You shouldn't lower it. Huh? Again, like I said, it's not. It's not such a simple thing to just tell women. Okay, you're not married, so therefore you should lower your mitzvot. Because for many women, I know, for example, for my wife, she's so connected to Kisuro, she sleeps with it. So some women get so close to, they, they feel the, the kedusha that comes from their mitzvot, whether it's they're reading Teilim or the Kisuro or the Chala or just uh, sending the kids to Yeshiva, whatever mitzvah that she really connects to, that. Every time she does it, she feels she's closer to Hashem. So a person that feels closeness to Hashem doesn't want to stop. So if that closeness is coming from putting Kisurosh, she obviously wouldn't want to stop it. So you shouldn't tell her, listen, you should stop it because the, your husband is a fool and left you. Uh, you should stop uh, doing it. So if she wants to continue wearing it, she should. And in fact, uh, in, in general, she should. And try to find a zivug with, with it. I have several students that are in that status that got divorced and are still wearing a kisurosh, and Baruch Hashem, they're still going on shiduchim and still looking for Mr. Wonderful, but that hasn't stopped the shiduchim. Uh, yes, there was somebody over here before you guys. Somebody over here was asking a question before. I told them I'll answer it. Okay. I have a, several letters here. Oh, it's Thanksgiving. Don't worry, it's not Shusha. <laughs> no, but man, that's, that's that's the history about Thanksgiving. Really? Yeah, history. Yeah, history of Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah, it's a history of how the uh, Americans killed a bunch of Indians. That's the history of Thanksgiving. Uh, I have many letters here about uh, the Whigs and things of that nature, the Puskim. I have a letter from uh, Rabbi Vadia Lava Shalom <coughs> that says that if an Avrech uh, says that he wants a uh, woman that wears a wig only, then sh the shiduch should be cancelled. He's a rasha. Uh, I have a uh, picture of um, of Kanievsky, the current Gdolado, burning some wigs. You know, after the uh, information came out that it's all coming from idolatry, this is the biggest rabbi in the world today, by all opinions. 
He's burning some wigs. It's not for fun. He has better things to do with his life than burning wigs. But like I told you, the mitzvah of destroying a wig is a mitzvah from the Torah. It's like burning idolatry. I have a, uh, plenty of information for anyone that wants to uh, see it. Some with me, some on the internet. I could send you. I have some poskim that wrote, that uh, signed a letter uh, saying that uh, you're not allowed to wear uh, wigs. There was actually an article that came out two weeks ago from uh, a keilah, the Satmer keilah, which was... Uh, wigs for them was standard but uh, at some point but they actually made it a psak that any woman that wears a wig is not allowed in Beknesset. Satman in New York, in Muncie, New York is not allowed in Beknesset. This happened two weeks ago. So the news, the news is coming out. People that want to do tshuva are finding a way to do it. People that don't want to do tshuva are finding an excuse to do it. So I have to look to all these letters but I'll look for it and I'll give it to you. Um, Nick. No, if, if this is she. So, Rav Ovadia said that if somebody wants to go on a shiduch, a woman wants to go on a shiduch, and she asked, I have a uh, avrech that I'm going to meet, uh, somebody learns Torah all the time, but his condition is that I uh, wear a wig after we get married. Okay, so a woman asked Rav Ovadia, should I continue going on a shiduch? with a man that says that the only way he would get married is if I put on a wig. Rabbi Vadia says that he is a rasha, canceled the shiduch, and even said it on, on, uh, on video, that he's considered like doega adomi, which is a person that has no share of the world to come on. Why? But then they asked him another question. They asked him, okay, but the guy, the guy found a woman. The guy found a woman. And she says, listen, I'm interested in getting married, but I'm only going to get married if you let me wear a wig. And they asked, and Rav says, marry her. So this contradicts. This contradicts. Why does it contradict? So now if the woman wants to, mar- wants to wear a wig, it simply means she has a yetzara, which is something that the husband can influence over time. If she loves him enough and he teaches her about enough about Hashem, eventually she will take off the wig and put on a mitpachat. So you shouldn't cancel the shiduch. But if the man wants the woman to wear a wig, that means that he's a rasha. That means that he wants to look at pretty women. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to get married. That means that he has a yitzharai. It has nothing to do with his wife. He wants to justify. When a man wants a woman to wear a wig, that means that he wants to justify him looking at other women. Why? I'll, I'll explain to you the logic. Because right now, today, who are the biggest advocates of wigs? Believe it or not, it's not women. It's men. Why? Now, obviously, one side is the business. There's a billion, billions of dollars in the, in the business. But not everybody's in the wig business. Why do men want wigs? Because... I'm telling you as a man, not even as a rabbi. Anyone that understands a little bit of psychology, psychology of a man versus psychology of a woman, knows that it's shamayim v'aretz. They're very, very different. A woman looks at a man, she looks at his personality. It's like, oh, he looks funny, he looks angry, he looks generous. She thinks about personality character traits. A man looks at a woman, he looks like a cattle. Oh, I could do this, I could do that. He doesn't think about any personality. He cares less about personality. That's the nature. That's the nature of a man. Nature of a man, he looks at a woman as an object. That's a reality. Rabotai, I'm one of you. It's a reality. I'm, I'm one of you. I'm not, it's a reality. This is why the whole time I'm looking at you and not at them. That's the way men are. That's the way we're programmed. Don't tell me you're not, because that would mean you don't belong in this world. You belong in Shamaim, like Eliyahu and Navi. Reality is, Rabotai, oh, you belong in San Francisco with the animals. But here, Rabotai, men look at women a certain way. Women look at men a certain way. Now, when a woman wants a wig, that means she wants to feel good in the eyes of who? In the eyes of men and women. Women that always like to talk and chit-chat about who, what she wears, what she wears, and they're competing amongst each other. But men, because she wants attention. (coughs) Meaning that a woman wants to look good simply because she has less attention than what she needs from a husband. 
If a husband makes her feel amazingly beautiful, she will never ever want to wear anything immodest in her life. Now, when a man wants his wife to wear a wig, it's a completely different argument. Why? Because now, if his wife wears a wig, that means that he can look at every other woman without her ever complaining about it. Why? Honey, I'm not looking at her. I'm looking at her wig. Look, she has a wig like yours. I'm not looking at her uh, dress. I'm looking, the dress is just like yours. He's giving himself a get out, of free, get out of jail free card to look at every woman in the world. Why? He doesn't know who has a wig, who doesn't have a wig. They all look the same. In reality, he's giving himself a get out of, free, get out of jail free card to not watch his eyes. That's a reality. That's psychology. That's a myth. That's why guys are the ones fighting for it and not women. Women want to fight it, but in reality, a woman that gets enough attention from her husband and love from her husband, she has no problem putting a meat pocket. Initially, it's a little difficult unless she gets a little bit of uh, getting used to, but ultimately, if she loves Hashem, she loves her husband, she'll do it. But the man, unless he wants to do tshuva for his eyes, start protecting his eyes, he's always going to tell his wife, no, you know what? I don't think the meat pocket looks good on you because look at uh, the rabbit's in. Look at this one. He's always going to compare it to other women. It's like, wait a minute. Why are you looking at other women? Torah tells, the Gemara Masech Brachot says, if a man doesn't look at another woman's hair or body, if he looks at another woman's pinky, if he looks at her hands, her hands, when? When he's giving her a change. Let's say you do business. You do business. You have to give somebody change. If he decides to give her a change slowly, just to make sure that he looks a little bit at her fingers. Not her hair, not our body. He just looks at her fingers. The Gemara says, there's no way that he could avoid going to Gainom. He's definitely going to Gainom. For what? For looking at her fingers. And this is not your own Ruven. This is Gemara. Machat Zerbachot. Rabotai. Yes, buy online. Buy online. It's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, good argument. But this habotai means that the eyes of a Jew, the eyes of a Jew are critical. The eyes, the mouth, the ears of a Jew are critical. Why? Because these are, some, these are the tools that Hashem gave you either to sanctify His name or to desecrate it. If you use your eyes the right way, instead of looking at women, you're going to look at chidushim in the Torah. But if you look at women, anytime you look at Torah, you're not going to understand anything. If you listen to Lashon Ara, anytime you listen to a lecture, you're not going to understand anything. If you speak Lashon Ara, anytime you want to say something, you're going to forget it. Meaning, the same tools that Hashem gave you to sanctify Hashem's name, it's also to desecrate His name. So when a man wants a woman, his own wife, to look attractive for who? For Steve and Joe and Wilbur at the supermarket. This is a man that obviously doesn't love his life. He loves other women, but he wants to justify a way to look at other women. He can't look at other women if his wife is tznua and she's a little tzadika and he's looking at other women. Why? Because it's obvious. So he said, no, 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 I didn't look at her. I wanted to compare her wig against yours. You have a much nicer wig. Yeah, but what about the other parts that you were looking at? No, no, I wasn't looking. I was looking. I was just thinking. Just thinking. All you need to know is a little bit of psychology. A little bit of psychology, human psychology, you know the whole thing is shekel. No man in his right mind should ever give a single argument to justify and defend the, the, the wearing of wigs. Why? If you're protecting your eyes, you should never even see a wig. Then there is no man, period, at all? It doesn't exist? It exists when the women wear mitpachat. If, if their wives wear mitpachat, then you have a better chance. But if men that look at other women, unfortunately, that's one of the biggest isulim you have in the Torah. Why? Because every single time you look at another woman, you start thinking about things in Shamayim, you have no idea what they say. The Sefer Hasidim considers a man that looks at another woman as if he was with her physically. So it's, it's, not, it's not so pursuit to just say it's okay to look at other women. The only, the, you have to understand that we, when you get married, Bezat Hashem, anybody that signs a ketubah, the guy signs his life over. And it's not just the money. It's his eternity. Why? He's obligated to the woman. What is he obligated to do? He's obligated to satisfy her physically anytime she wants. Not the opposite. People think it's the opposite. Now what does that mean aside from the obvious? It means that his eyes and mind also belong to her. 
not just his time and his body meaning his eyes and his mind belong to his wife which means that anytime his eyes and his mind are about another woman you have an isu from a Torah. you're violating the ketubah and that's why there's an opinion in Gemara, I believe it's Masichet Sota, that says if a man thinks of another woman while he's with his wife, there's some chachamim that say maybe it's a mamzer, maybe it's not really considered like a, a legitimate child. Why? He's thinking about another woman. It's, he's not really with his wife. And the Shulchan Aruch says, what if a man had a dream? You know, men have dreams. Everybody has dreams. But he dreamt about somebody else, not his wife. What could he do? He wakes up, can he do something? Not allowed to touch his wife. Okay, better yet. What if he dreamt about his wife? He dreamt about his wife. He says, honey, I dreamt about you. Shulchan Aruch says, stay away from your wife. Not allowed to touch your wife until you cool down. Why? Whatever woman a man sees in his wife in his dream is not his wife. It's it's the Satan's wife. Who pretends to be his wife. Why? Because she wants him to waste seed, so she creates more demons. The point is Rabotai. Judaism is not Avodah Zarash Tuyot of the Goim that have black and white. We every single step that you make in your life has significance for eternity.